All right, so taking a look at Gaines Mill, still um, on the 6 a, starting the 6 a.m. turn on the 27th. Um, the game started on like the 2 or 3 p.m. turn on the 26th, so we've run through uh, a dozen or maybe 20 turns. Um, through the night turns, um, and this is where fatigue might come into play because the Union spent most of the night moving. Uh, the Confederates spent part of the night moving. Um, but when you're moving at night turns, uh, you take double the fatigue, uh, mostly because those turns are, are condensed into hour-long turns instead of the usual daylight half-hour turns. So, But as you can see, the, the positions have changed substantially. The Union is here along Boatswain's Swamp. I don't know, I think in the na in naval terminology, I think that's pronounced Boatswain's. Um, but uh, that's it's not actually the swamp. I mean, there's some swamp hexes there, but it's actually this whole creek that runs along in front of the, the Union position. Um, they've anchored their right on Old Cold Harbor there, and I, I, historically they may have been tighter than that. They may have been more along this natural line, uninterrupted line of the creek there. Um, to defend their position. The main reason I put them here at Old Cold Harbor was I didn't want to leave this intersection open um, for the Confederates to try and freely use, use this road to move around and potentially get on the Union flank or in behind them. So uh, that's why I anchored the, the Union position out here at Old Cold Harbor. Um, it is a potential... Um, problem for the Union not having substantial terrain here, which is why I, I concentrated a lot of their artillery firepower along this end of the line, because they've got these nice wide open fields of fire here. Um, the left portion of the Union line around Turkey Hill is, as you can see, more heavily wooded, um, and I've, I've even backed the Union off of the line of the creek itself to take advantage of these slopes, um, which will give fire advantages on, the, uh, on any potential close combat rolls. And there is some artillery. I've got one artillery position here that's got an open field of fire. And then the 6th Corps came on. That was one of the things, um, I think, starting on the 3 or 4 a.m. turn there. And you can see there's more that can potentially come on underneath the turn marker. Um, the, the Union has to roll a die to see if the 6th Corps reinforcements will come on. There's two divisions of the 6th Corps that can potentially come on to reinforce. And they come on um, through one of these southern edges of maps B or C. So I, I was successfully rolled, I think at 4 a.m. Um, or 5 a.m. for uh, one of the six core divisions to come on, uh, Slocum's first division. Um, the second one I haven't made the roll for yet, so they may never arrive, we'll see. Uh, but I did bring on the six core uh, brigades and they brought some artillery with them and that artillery is gonna move to this position here, which is a nice elevated position that's got an open field of fire on the Union left. Um, and then I'll anchor uh, use the 6th Corps to anchor that Union left position and leave two brigades of the 6th Corps in reserve. So hopefully that will be um, enough in case there are any breakthroughs potentially um, at this portion of the line, which the Confederates may concentrate on just to avoid the guns um, of the Union right end. I mean, although they will have to to perform some sort of either diversionary or, or um, you know, sideshow assault on the Union right, um, just to avoid the Union shifting forces to the left to focus the main Confederate against the main Confederate thrust. Um, but we'll see. Uh, the Confederates are going to have some problems of their own, uh, namely, and you can see. Um, so the old the old Union position was here at Beaver Dam Creek. Overnight, they shifted all the way over to here, uh, moving quickly along these roads. Uh, McClellan is off the map to the south, so his orders take an extra turn to arrive. So I think at the time, Porter, the 5th Corps commander, was here at uh, the Walnut Grove Church. And uh, he uh, received the orders and accepted them on the first try. So um, and that was sometime but shortly before nightfall uh, on the 26th. And so the Union troops moved overnight, which is what they historically did. They, they left this position. Um, the Confederates didn't get off any attacks along the Beaver Dam Creek, even though initially I had orders for them all to attack when they got up to Mechanicsville. Um, they didn't, uh, by the time they were starting to get in position, 
Um, it, AP Hill was in like a delay status and uh, it was getting close to sunset. So I just had Lee cancel all those orders when they were all stacked here in the same hex. Um, they accepted all the, the, the cancel order cancellations. So historically AP Hill had launched an attack and, and sustained some substantial losses along Beaver Dam Creek. So it's probably just as well that the Confederates didn't attack. Um, but you know, the Union, this was, a, this was a strong position for the Union to be in, but once Jackson arrived and was getting around up on the flank here and behind them, it was obviously an untenable position for them to stay in, so they had to displace. I moved them back to the historic line that they took uh, historically, um, which was the left on Turkey Hill and then around here. There's a number of victory point locations here from you know where the Union position was historically. So that's where they are now. Uh, the Confederates, however, you know, once Lee saw the Union moving out, he quickly issued orders to have uh, the, the Confederate troops pursue. Um, I did give those, make those complex orders, potential attack orders, uh, just because I didn't want to have simple movement orders where the Union could have potentially stopped short of where they did and have the Confederates come plowing into them in column. That would be disastrous. So this way, uh, the orders that I wrote were to I think A.P. Hill to move to the Fairfield Plantation here, and then uh, D.H. Hill to move to the Selwyn Plantation, and I think I've got Longstreet moving to Gaines Mill, um, and all of them were to move there and await further orders, but uh, they were to engage any Union troops that they might run into along the way, so uh, just so they wouldn't have to, you know, roll initiative to deploy or something. Um, so they all started moving except for Longstreet. Longstreet's stuck in delay, and I've not been able to get him out of it, so he's, even though he was there with all the other guys at Mechanicsville with Lee in the tent, listening to Lee's orders, he's like, well, I'm gonna give my guys a good night's sleep and a nice hefty breakfast, and maybe we'll think about moving sometime tomorrow. Uh, meanwhile, A.P. Hill's Corps division has largely arrived. D.H. Hill's division is circling, and then, uh, the real stroke of luck was to get Jackson moving. Jackson's a zero and Lee's a three, meaning that any orders that Lee sends to Jackson are gonna be on the three column, assuming Lee's not in the same hex with him, which he's not, because Jackson is too far away. Lee's making his way along here. Um, so on the three column for orders acceptance, you've got one shot uh, to get an accept and not be stuck in delay or just have the orders thrown away completely. Uh, you need to roll a six on a 2d6, no modifiers. And uh, that's exactly what happened. So, um, and he, I didn't give him complex orders because I knew he wouldn't be really running in, or I was taking the gamble that he wasn't running in Union troops. But if I give him complex orders, you're on an even lower chart and then you're, you're automatically in delay. You don't have any chance to accept at all. So I was like, well, let's give him at least a chance to accept. And sure enough, I rolled a six on 2d6. So I rolled a five and a one. So the one guy that I thought would be very difficult to get moving um, turned out to move, to start moving immediately, or, you know, within the three turns or two turns or whatever it took him to, to get the orders there, I forget. Um, so he's on his way, and I've got him moving here to Beulah Church and waiting for their orders. Uh, while Longstreet, the guy that was in the tent, you know, sits on his hands. So just, uh, you know, it's the beauty of the orders, the, the CWBS orders system um, that leaves you struggling to coordinate. Because, I mean, this is going to be a problem with Longstreet's entire division sitting over there. You know, I don't have endless time. I don't have days and days to do this. This is the last day. There's, this is a two-day battle, and this is it. You know, so my, my chances of breaking the Union line or breaking the Union position and destroying the Fifth Corps it's got to happen today, and the Confederates have the numbers to do it, but not really without Longstreet's division. I mean, that's this is not an insubstantial force here, and Lee needs that uh, to bring. He needs to be able to bring it all to bear all at once um, to have a really good chance of, of breaking through and, you know, crumbling part of the Union position and getting into these victory point hexes back here and inflicting the casualties that he needs to inflict. Uh, to, to get a victory and you know without Longstreet there it's going to be hard enough once uh, Jackson gets here to Beulah Church just to get Jackson attacking you know and he's going to be hitting this side of the Union line AP Hill's probably going to be hitting the middle and DH Hill's going to be hitting the left you know you need Longstreet to bring those those numbers to bear and so how long can these guys sit here 
<coughs> excuse me, how long can these guys sit here and wait for Longstreet to, you know, finish breakfast and uh, meander his way over here? Uh, you know, they're going to have to start attacking. And is it going to work with without that entire division? I don't know, especially with the Union now getting a Sixth Corps division and a huge one at that, all these Sixth Corps brigades, there's three of them, they're all triple A size brigades. Those are massive and can extend the line uh, pretty substantially. So, and they're not, this wasn't a C, I think the other twos are Bs, so they're not exactly, you know, worthless troops. So, and they've got more artillery. And there's a potential of another entire six core division. Um, if I roll a 10 or higher on a 2D6, um, there's continually throughout the day, there's the potential for more uh, Union. Uh, more six core divisions to come. So it's not any guarantee for the Confederates at all at this point. Uh, you know, historically, I mean, you know, looking at the, at the tactical situation, yes, they've got the fifth core on the run and you're trying to get back across the Chickahominy um, to join up with the rest of the Union Army as McClellan decides to turn tail and run from Richmond. But, um, you know, to actually win this battle, win this game, they need to inflict a lot of casualties, and they need to get those victory points. And they've gotten some victory points, you know, some of these star locations, those are, I forget what it is, somewhere between one and three points each for those. Um, but it's really going to come from inflicting casualties, and so they need to get a, a good engagement going to do that, um, to have any chance uh, to actually get, you know, satisfied of the victory conditions. So, that's where it sits for now. Um, we'll see once the, the Confederates get in position, Lee issues some new orders. We'll see if they can get something underway while the Union will continue to dress and improve their line and uh, hopefully be able to defend their position and repulse the Confederates with heavy losses. We shall see.